Hello and welcome to the latest Blood Red podcast from the Liverpool Echo. I'm your host, Matt Addison, with Paul Ghost, Ian Doyle and Charlotte Coates all with me as we have a chat about Liverpool's eventful 3-1 win over Crystal Palace this weekend. Plenty to get into. I'll come to you first, Ghosty. You were at Selhurst Park, of course, on Sunday. It felt like it was going to be quite straightforward for the first half an hour or so of the game, but then it turned into a little bit more of a challenge. It did, didn't it? Yeah, um, we, we were talking before the game and Doyle was saying it's not going to be like it was last time they were in, they won 7 0. And I'm thinking, yeah, okay, fair enough. And then after 20, 25 minutes, I was actually thinking to myself, um, if they get another one here, they, and if it's if it's 3 0 before half time, maybe Liverpool, Liverpool can go on and make it 5 or 6 and really make it comfortable because they were just in control so much, particularly in the first half an hour. Deserved the two goals that they got in that time. Um, Van Dijk was a superb header and, and a really good finish from Oxley Chamberlain, to be fair. Andy Robertson was superb in that time. And then um, got to about 35, 36 minutes and the, um, it was almost like flicking an off switch. Liverpool just completely stopped playing. A couple of silly mistakes let Palace back into the game and then they, they took that into the second half, didn't they? And to be fair to Palace, put Liverpool right under it for the second half. Um, so Liverpool... Got away with it, really. It was a, it was a tired performance, particularly in the, the the second half, and I think that was down to the fact that nine of the eleven had started on Thursday night at Arsenal, um, and one of one of those changes was the goalkeeper. Um, Klopp makes no bones about the fact that playing Thursday night and Sunday afternoon is one of the toughest you can have as a as a schedule. So um, I suppose Liverpool should just be thankful that they've uh, picked up what. There's a massive three points after City, you know, slipped up, I suppose, at Southampton on Saturday. And they go into a, a nice little fortnight off now to get a few bodies back. Um, the African lads, um, Elliot and Thiago, continuing their comeback. And then on the other side of it, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a, in a week or two or so, but you're looking at it now, thinking Liverpool can have a really big push for the final third of the season. They've still got everything to play for. They're still, Champions League's coming back. They're still within slightest of touching distance to City, the Carabao Cup finals to come and an FA Cup home tie against Cardiff, which doesn't look too difficult. So um, they've ridden the storm quite well after beginning January with that 2-2 draw at Chelsea when it looked like all hope was lost on the Premier League front. Um, we're looking at it now thinking, um, you know, what, what could still be possible for the, you know, the last three months of this season. Yeah, it was an important win, Donny. I mean, it's not the first time this season, though, that Liverpool have kind of been in control. And then given the op- opponent that they're coming up against, you think of, of Brighton and Brentford and a couple of other games this season where they've maybe been well on top and, and let their opponent back into it. Is that a concern for you at all? Or what What did you sort of make of, of the game in that regard? Yeah, it's not a concern now, no. I mean, obviously it happened against Chelsea. Chelsea are quite decent at football. You know, it was a bit different with Brighton, but Liverpool were awful that day. Uh, Atletico Madrid, it happened again, but, you know, Atletico Madrid were, well, they still are, aren't they? The reigning champions of Spain, aren't they? I think they are, yeah. aren't they? I think they won it last year, yeah. So, from that respect, it wasn't that much of a, you know, it, while it was annoying, the fact that it was happening so many times was a concern rather than it happening one-off. And, I, you know, I don't, I, as I said before the game, I didn't think Liverpool would win 7-0. I think I said 2-1, didn't I, in the... Uh, in the prediction, I said it'd be a proper tough game, and you know, we'll get on to the penalty in a bit, but I'm pretty sure it should have finished 2 1. Um, but overall, I think okay, a lot of people are making a, a making a, a big deal of the fact that Liverpool fell off so dramatically for the last say 40 minutes. Uh, well, certainly between about 35 minutes to about 75 minutes, they were just absolutely nowhere near it, but they ended up doing okay in the end in the last five or ten minutes, even before the, the penalty. I thought they kind of slightly got to grips with things a little bit better. Um, but just the first 35 minutes was probably the best football Liverpool have played all season. I think you, you can't ignore that. I think overall Liverpool deserved the victory purely on the, the strength of that. And they could have had a couple more goals. And Palace, you know, I know where they are in the table, you know, bottom half. But whenever I've seen them play, they played played at Anfield. I thought they were unlucky to get beat 3-0. I think there's, there's certainly a certain bit of that. I think that... Uh, They've got some good players there. I know they were missing Zahar, but Liverpool, you know, as we know, were missing Salah and Mane. And overall, I think Liverpool can, you know, there can't many complaints over the fact that Liverpool won, but though there will be complaints over 
the scoreline and certain aspects of the game. But I think overall, you know, I'm pretty sure Chris, if uh, Manchester City had gone to Crystal Palace and won by the scoreline, they'll be making a massive deal of it. Yeah, we'll come to two of the, the Liverpool goals shortly, but we'll uh, go for the, the less controversial one, Charlotte, first. The, the Virgil van Dijk goal. It means Liverpool have scored more goals from set pieces this season in the Premier League than any other team. It, it doesn't really feel like that to me. Is that a surprise at all to you? Yeah, it is. Um, when they put the chart up yesterday on the telly, obviously before that goal, they were they were level, weren't they? I think, with West Ham, maybe. Um, but you always think West Ham is such a massive threat when you watch them. Um, I mean as Liverpool found out. Um, but Liverpool's delivery just seems awful from corners. It always seems to hit the first man. So you don't, I, I don't know, you don't really realise that they do actually <laughs> cause a threat, pause a, fe- a threat there. Um, but I suppose when you've got someone as big as Van Dijk in there, it only takes one one good delivery and he's doing what he did yesterday. But like, Matip, for the size of him, he doesn't really threaten, does he, from corners? And when he's had a chance, he he seems to fluff it. But yeah, it, it is a bit of a surprise that Liverpool are so good at scoring, at scoring from corners. Let's move on to a couple of, of the other goals then, Gorse. The VAR came under a bit more scrutiny. I actually thought, to be honest, that I could kind of see why the penalty was given. For me, the more controversial one should have been the other one because Roberto Firmino quite clearly is offside and quite clearly goes to play the ball. So I don't know whether you agree with me on that one. What what were your thoughts on, on each of those two incidents? Yeah, I don't know really with the with the second one because um, you look at City's goal against Southampton the day before. Um, Rodri's in an offside position when, when City attacked the ball and it's only because Laporte gets there ahead of him that he doesn't go for it so that was that that stood and, and so did Liverpool so maybe there's at least a little bit of a consistency there perhaps um but with, with the Jota one it, it wasn't a penalty was it let's face it you know Jota's flicked out at it missed and then just cleverly just leans into the keeper and and guy to takes him out um so I think he's bought one there but I'm not I mean I'm a little bit surprised by the um the reaction of, you know, looking at Twitter today and um, immediately after the game that there seems to be this idea that if Liverpool wouldn't have scored that penalty, they wouldn't have won the game. Um, they've won the, go- they won the game by two goals, so if they don't get that penalty, they win the game 2-1. There wasn't a whole lot of time left. Liverpool have held on for a long time at 2-1. Um, who's to say the Palace were going to go up and, and score? So, um, you know... Sometimes you get them, sometimes you don't. I don't think it was a penalty, but Liverpool certainly, or Jota in particular, didn't get one at Tottenham when he was barged in the back by Emerson Royale. So um, you win some and you lose some, don't you? Um, but yeah, I just found it a bit strange that there seems to be this kind of um, idea that Liverpool wouldn't have scored that penalty in the 90-something minute that they wouldn't have won the game. Um, they won the game by two goals. Yeah, calls for a Premier League investigation by some people. I saw on uh, Twitter, a Hollywood actor, I believe as well, gave the uh, the same sort of comment. So some interesting uh, claims around that, certainly. Doyle, I'll come to you as well on the, the penalty decision. I mean, Gorsty said it there, Jota was clever. I think that's the way I would look at it. I know a lot of people have made the argument that the ball had gone and therefore it shouldn't be a penalty, but I'm not entirely sure whether that's relevant. But what did you make of it? No, it's 100% not a penalty. The only people who give that as a penalty are people who've never played football or you know, or people who just think that all contact... I mean, I, the, the interesting thing for me is that I saw people say, if that, was a, if that had happened anywhere else on the pitch, it would be a foul. It's like, well, hang on, it wouldn't have happened anywhere else on the pitch because he's the goalkeeper. As if the player would be sliding along on the floor on his knees like trying to tackle somebody. It just wouldn't happen. And then you would give a foul. You'd be like, get up. What are you doing? You know, so I don't, I don't, I don't see that as being... It was never a penalty. And even at the time, I was saying, what's he, what, what are we checking here? What's going on? You know, just get on with the game. Just wasting time. Come on. I've got to find my stuff. Um, so, no, it wasn't a penalty. As for the first, after the second goal, the Firmino one, sorry. I don't think it's offside. I don't think it's offside. I think I think there's such massive confusion over it. The ball was far enough away from him. It wasn't. Even, you can tell he didn't even aim for it. I mean, it was too far over his head, you know. And that, that happens all the time, as Ghosty said. It happened with City. And then this interpretation of the rules. It's like, well, hang on, he was in front of him. So it doesn't matter how he's behind him and he did get it. So it's like, so does it matter which player gets it in the end or which order that the player who's offside is stood compared to the player who's onside? 
So I don't know, but um, to be honest, I didn't even notice that that the, the second goal could have been offside until I got home and watched match today. And it's like, what are people talking about? I hadn't even mm-hmm. I hadn't even got onto this at the time, you know. So uh, no one seemed to. Palace certainly didn't complain. I don't think it would have made any difference anyway. I mean, to be fair, you should go back and have a look at some of the, you know, that wish to put my old man's hat on. Go and have a look at some of the old offside. Literally everything is offside. Everything is offside. And the players never complain about it. But there's like been loads of like brilliant goals choked off. Someone does an over a kick from the edge of the area. And there's a player stood over here on the far side in front of the defence. Nowhere near anyone. It's given offside. No one complains because they knew what the rules were. And I think part of the problem is nobody knows what the rules are in terms of offside because they keep on changing the intricacies of it all the time and the interpretation. So, yeah, I mean, as for the penalty, though, no. It's never, it's never, ever, ever, ever a penalty. And if that's given as a penalty against your team, you'd be absolutely livid. But by the same token, as Gorsley said, Liverpool were winning 2-1. And Vieira was right when he said that, look, it took away our hope because the, you could imagine in the last five, six, seven minutes, Palace would have you know, put for a few players for. But as I said, it looked as though Liverpool would, had kind of ridden that particular storm by that point. So, I don't know. I do think that, by the way, anybody who says that VAR is totally pro-Liverpool has clearly not watched any Liverpool games over the past couple of years. I mean, what was it? Firmino's el- armpit offside. Um, so, yeah. yeah, so, you know, make, people need to make their mind up which, which, which one do you want. So... I'm pretty sure that all the fans of the other team want whatever decision is against Liverpool, but then that's the same for... I mean, I saw, what was it, United's goal against uh, West Ham, the last-minute goal at the weekend. Some people were saying it was offside. And that's, at the time, I, then I actually saw it and went, it's not offside, it's clearly onside. I don't know why people are complaining, but people kind of see what they want to see, and that's the world that we're living in at the moment. Yeah, and as, as Gorsi mm-hmm. said before as well, when you've got two or three incidents which are the same but come with different outcomes, it's just that intricacy. It just gets very, very complicated. But we'll move on anyway from VAR, Charlotte. I wanted to, to ask you about Alison Becker, who I thought was probably Liverpool's man of the match on the day. Obviously, we know how good a goalkeeper he is, but he certainly gave another reminder of that. Oh, yeah, it's what, it's, it's what Liverpool have needed for before they signed Alisson. Just didn't have, well, in my lifetime, never had a goalkeeper where... You can you can rely on him like that to essentially win you a game as such because he made he made some fantastic saves yesterday and it's why you pay sixty odd million pound for a player because they win your points. Um, but he just he just gives you this confidence, doesn't he? That if Liverpool are dominating and then you know full well that a team is going to get a chance because um, games don't just dominate for ninety minutes. So. But you just you just know that he's there and he's always concentrating. He's ready to to rescue Liverpool if if needed. And yeah, that's it's what you pay the money for. Yeah, particularly brilliant save from him on Odson Edward. I think it was with the the back heel that he did particularly well with with that one. Can, there. Can I just quote my dad when we're talking about goalkeepers here? One thing that he always says was, "I hate it when when team." Teams say, or people say about a team's performance, and say, "Oh, they were lucky. The goalkeeper had a good game." <laughs> it's like, well, that's what he's there for. And in fact, that's what Allison said, didn't he, after the game when you know Clock came up to him and he says, "Well, that's my job." You know, it's like saying, "Oh, you know, uh, you know, I don't know." Somebody, Man City, are lucky that they've got these good players playing good games. It's like, well, that's what they're there for. So, I don't know. Very good point. Anyway, we'll move up to the, the other end of, of the pitch, Gorsty, in terms of Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain. I believe it's the first time he scored in two consecutive league games for the first time in, I think, two years, February 2020. I think that the last time that, that happened is he gets him back to his best. I think, obviously, with players away at AFCON, he's had an opportunity and seemingly has taken it. Yeah, he has, to be fair to him. Yeah, he had, he had a good hour, didn't he? I think that change was predetermined because uh, he only returned to training on Friday, possibly, after that ankle injury against Brentford. Um, and I, I actually asked Pep Linders about him in the week because um, I think Klopp said after he didn't start the first leg against Arsenal that he was disappointed not to have started it and felt that he probably should have been given the lack of attacking options available. And I, I said to Linders, you know, after he scored against Brentford, was he disappointed to have picked up that injury, you know, at a time when he was really, he was given his chance and he, he seemed to have taken it. And he said, well, what, what I like about Oxley chamberlain is he's very positive and he, he seems to be willing to, you know, get stuck in and, and he's really got a, a good outlook on this. And, you know, he's, he's trying to prove himself to be fit for Sunday. And, and he did. And then he's shown up and he scored and he's played on the right. Um, 
And for for me, I think he's a he's almost like the perfect squad player for Liverpool in terms of somebody who can come in into midfield. He can play across the front three if needed. And at a time when players are unavailable or injured or wherever they may be, um, Oxley Chamberlain is someone who can cover a, a multitude of, of positions. So yeah, he's um he's done well to be fair. He's he's kind of made hay while the sun shone and. 18 months left on his contract now and maybe he just thinks that he's got to start making the most of any opportunities that come his way if he wants to make sure that he stays at the club. Um, but yeah, he's, he's certainly done well and um, he might find himself a little bit more, uh, you know, he, he might have to prove himself a little bit more in the coming weeks when Mane and Salah return and, you know, Thiago and, and Elliot are back possibly in contention. But um, he's certainly done enough while... Um, you know, he's, he's been given his chances over the last couple of weeks. I suppose that's the the thing, isn't it, Charlotte, in terms of his, his contract situation at the end of this season, of course, they'd only have a year left. And as Gorsty said, as well as he's done over the last couple of weeks, you'd still wonder whether he's going to play as much going forward, of course, with all of those options coming back into the squad. Oh, yeah, of course. Well, when before, before his injury, we're really starting to... You could see why Liverpool bought him, couldn't you? And for the fee as well, like he wasn't cheap. Um, but he just gave he gave something different in the midfield, like driving forward and beating players, and it was just it was just something different. Um, but then obviously after his injury, it's been it's been difficult for him to to really come back into the side. And then obviously Liverpool have been successful with the midfield that they had that that workman like midfield. Um, but then you felt that at times when he did come back into the side, he weren't really, really taking his chance. Um, so then he were getting pushed out wide and even in even in a false nine position. So he's not been playing his, his favourite position, has he? But it's just about making the most of what opportunity you get. And as you said, with not so long left on his contract, um, it makes you wonder what, whether he'll get offered a new one or whether he'll be happy with a bit of a squad squad player role at Liverpool. But I'd be happy for him to stay. I think, as you said, he's he's a great squad player for Liverpool and you've got James Milner soon, his, his career coming to an end at, at some point. Um, so you need you can need someone who can fill in in different positions. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, an important goal for him personally and for, for Liverpool, Doyle. In terms of the Premier League title race, I think Gorsty mentioned it before, mm. obviously nine points behind now Manchester City, but with a game in hand for Liverpool. We thought it was all over. Have they dragged you back in to, to any extent or is it still over? I'm pretty sure it's still over, yeah. I think you're still looking at Liverpool winning all the games and beating Man City and then Man City not winning a game, losing a game or not winning two. I mean, I'll be honest, Man- Liverpool will prob- could easily beat Man City and Man City will not win two games. But will Liverpool win every single game this season? I don't think so. Um, especially with, you know, they're in, as we've mentioned before, they're in contention on four fronts, which, using my factoids and stuff, I think that's the first time that's gone into February that they've been in four competitions since 1983. So even I can barely remember that. That's how long ago that is. So... Um, you know, that is a sign of how, how kind of well things are going this season for Liverpool. I know we get, you know, you've seen them fans just moaning about this, that, and the other. Well, they've got through January without buying anybody, and they've got to a League Cup final. They've got to the fourth round of the FA Cup. They've actually closed the gap on Man City without Salah and Mane being there. So, you know, what more could they possibly have done? So, going back to Ox, by the way, I think people forget because I've just checked now. People forget that when Liverpool won the league in 1920. Ox started 17 of those 38 Premier League games and he was he was in the he was in the squad for 34 of them and he only failed to get off the bench in four. So he, he had 30 appearances. So he was a regular member. He was playing in various positions. I think he played he was, on the left wing sometimes, didn't he? So he was fourth top scorer as well, I think. Yeah. yeah so you know, that's that's something that you know last season for uh, he obviously got the injury at the start of the season. He missed quite a few months. He never. It took him ages to get up to speed. It was his first goal of the season at Burnley, right at the end. I think that's right, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So this season, he's actually played in nearly all of the games this season. or certainly been involved. So for him to get his two goals, I think it's a good sign. I thought he'd been. I thought he'd been playing well in midfield, in central midfield. I thought he'd been 
contributing because you've got to, you know, bear in mind the, the players that Liverpool have had missing in there. Harvey Elliott started there, he got injured. Thiago's been in and out. Curtis Jones was missing for a few months. Henderson got tired. Milner got injured. Cater got injured and then got gone off to the AFCON. So he's had to take on this position, this kind of role of responsibility. And he's done it both, as you know, as Gorsi said, up on the right wing of the last couple of games, filling the shoes of Mohamed Salah, which has, given the way Liverpool play, that's, that's not such an easy task. And, you know, there have been a lot of players who, who you'd think would have fancied themselves in that position and not been able to do it. But Liverpool have never been involved. It had to have that situation because Salah's never really been away or been injured, in, certainly in league games. I think we've mentioned that in the past. So for the person playing the right wing to score in both games... I think he couldn't have, couldn't have done any more. Yeah, two positions on the pitch as well that you would expect to see Mohamed Salah popping up in, yeah, so exactly. in the right place at, at the right time, wasn't he? Just in, in terms of, of the title race, Gorsty, just before we move on and, and have a little bit of a, a chat about Harvey Elliott, of course, he's not the only one coming back. Thiago, hopefully back before Cardiff. Salah, Mane and Cater at some point over the next couple of weeks are, are going to be back. Is that more the reason to be excited from this position for, for Liverpool than any sort of glimmer of, of title hope for you? Or where do you sort of stand on that one? Uh, yeah, well, you might be shocked to find that I'm a bit more upbeat than Dooley is. Um, I think <laughs> the results on Saturday... How is, even, how is that possible? How can anybody mean, be more upbeat than me, Mr <laughs> Positivity? Just my natural, you know, yeah. disposition. Or, or, sorry, I'm, I'm false positive. That's the one. Yeah. Um, no, I, I think Saturday's draw with City and Southampton and Liverpool doing what they did yesterday is has flung it open, to be honest. Liverpool absolutely have to win that game against Leeds, that rearranged game, which will take them to within six points of City, you know, uh, whenever that's played. Um, say this, let's, let's say, for an argument, say Liverpool play that game Saturday and they win it, they go within six points of City. They've got to win at the Etihad. Um, and then you've got to hope that City slip up somewhere or other whilst they take care of their own business. And they may not, that may not happen. They may not win the league. They, they're still massively outsiders for it. But it's a hell of a lot more uh, positive than it was, what, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, um, it, even last week. So, yeah, um, all of a sudden, I think they've got to come through a really tricky period. Um, Doom merchants were. You know, casting doubt over January. No Salah, no Mane, no Cater. Liverpool need six new attackers. They need four new midfielders, and they need this, that, and the other. Um, and I don't think I don't think a lot of it was down to people actually looking at it and thinking, well, do you know what? It's actually only two Premier League games. It's Brentford at home and it's Palace away. Um, they've won both of them. They've um, managed to come through unscathed against Arsenal after a really poor first leg. But in the final of the Carabao Cup, the Champions League's on its way back in three weeks. Um, they're in the FA Cup in the fourth round at home to Cardiff so everything at the moment is looking a lot rosier than it was at the beginning of the month when Liverpool were really in a bit of a sticky patch they were getting COVID diagnoses left and right um, we knew that Salah, Mane and Keita were going to be going for over a month um, looking at it now the picture has changed massively and um, as, as Klopp would say they're going to um, they're going to give it all and, and see where they land. I don't I, you know, they probably won't win the Premier League, but as I say, it's looking a lot brighter than it was a couple of weeks ago. And um, they've got a Wembley appearance on that horizon as well. What about you, Charlotte, then, just to, to finish? Is it still on? Would I suppose that the way to look at it be if Liverpool do win that game in hand and it was six points right now, we'd probably look at it in a, a slightly different way, wouldn't we? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to say that it's just in a normal season. Well, in in a, a race where you're not against this city team, you would say that the title race is on like six points if if they win that Leeds game. You've seen you've seen it turn around, turn around, but it's just this city team, isn't it? Like if if they went from now to the end of the season and they didn't lose a game, you wouldn't be shocked. Um and yeah, Liverpool have to play them. So obviously they've got to win that game, but it's at City toughest place to go in a, in the country. So I'd, you don't want to say that, no, it's dead because you want a bit of excitement. You don't want to go from pretty much February until May and basically thinking, oh, the title's gone. Um, but in all likelihood, it probably is gone. Yeah, certainly still plenty of <laughs> matches to <laughs> play. Yeah, <you> <laughs> Hang on, whoa, whoa, wait, wait a minute. Ghosty said, yeah, they're probably not going to win the league. 
And Charlotte's saying, yeah, it's gone. <laughs> right? <laughs> and you're having to go at me for being naked. What's going on here? Stop picking no, on me. Stop picking from, on the old guy. Come on. From, Come on. You young years, I think taking up responsibility. <coughs> I, I don't think you can say it's gone definitively. I think you, you can say that the are outside is obviously, but certainly not as done and dusted as we thought it was when Liverpool drew one all with uh, two two with Chelsea on what the second of January was it? Yeah, Charlotte makes a good point that I mean again, old person alert, but you know I've seen things and um, there's been I think Newcastle were a long way ahead in '96. They got caught by United, and United were a long way ahead of Arsenal. I can't remember whether it was '98 or 2002, but they got caught. So it's doable. And how many points were Liverpool ahead of City in '19? Was it seven at one point? But City had a game in hand. Or something, it was something along those lines. Or it, there was there was kind of a gap, and then Liverpool drew quite a few games, and that kind of fell away. Yeah, and a little bit. Leicester and West Ham, wasn't it? Yeah, and then Everton and United. I Everton United, but you'd never say they had bad results, you know. But 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 then City, you know, City overcame it. I think it was Arsenal, as I said, in two thousand two or ninety eight, and United in ninety six. So it's doable. But it's the fact the City team just wins all the time mm-hmm. and uh, but I, the interesting thing for me is I do wonder whether some of the other teams are look and go hang on Southampton got a point to get City playing a certain way of doing this can we do something like that because we're now getting to the point of the season where there's an awful lot of teams down the bottom of that table and teams who are fighting for four there's a lot of teams who are definitely playing for stuff who are now going to be playing City going right we need to get something we've got to do something here and I wonder what because that's something perhaps that's not quite been so evident in a lot of the games this season. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with, with the games they have coming up. They've got Everton coming up as well, so that, that will be very interesting at Goodison. I think I'm right in saying as well they've got Aston Villa on the last game of the season, which is obviously Stephen Gerrard, but do the will take I, I suspect it may have been... It's probably going to be done by that point, but mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. it will make things interesting. You're thinking you a long know. way ahead, thinking a bit of a... Bit I'm of getting a little bit excited there. Yeah, yeah. exactly, yeah. yeah. Too excited too soon. Anyway, I think there's still 15 or 16 games to go, so we will uh, revisit that, I'm sure, plenty of times between now and then. Just to finish, though, obviously no preview for a game this time because, of course, Liverpool don't play until they play Cardiff in the FA Cup in a couple of weeks. But I did want to to have a chat about Harvey Elliott and obviously his return to to training. Doyle, I'll come to you. Obviously, great to, to see Harvey Elliott back. He's, for a player who's only played, what, three games this season, probably welcome back as, as if he's been a, a big miss, but he is still very young. We don't want to put too much pressure on his shoulders, but obviously great to, to see him back and, and playing again. Well, the fact that Liverpool have lost, what is it, two of 40 odd games means there won't be any pressure on him at all. No one's expected anything from him. I think a lot of people thought he wouldn't play again this season. So I think from that, that perspective, he'll he'll feature the way that he needs to feature and there, there shouldn't be any any problem. That he'll just come back when he's ready. Um I think Gorsty's you wrote a piece, didn't you, Paul, on when they're expecting him to be coming back or his rehabilitation. So yeah. I think that and you obviously you can you speak a bit more on that, but in terms of what he can bring to the team, it's quite interesting, isn't it? Because there's people sometimes probably have forgotten. But because of that, it's, I'm not gonna say he's like a new signing because people hate saying stuff like that, but he will be coming in as somebody who, as I said just then, no pressure on him. He'll, the other players will know what he can do because they'd already shown at the start of the season they got trust in him, the way that they, they played alongside him. So it'll be nothing to lose for him, really. Yeah, yeah. Gorsty, we'll, we'll throw over to you. Yeah, I, I wrote a piece last week on, on the day he returned to training, actually. Um, I think, um, I mean, Pep, Pep Linders was, was effusive in his, in his praise of how good Elliot looked in training and, and then Klopp echoed it on on the Friday, I think, but um, there's no there's no rush or no uh, you know appetite to to get him back in the team any sooner than than um, is safe really. You know he's only 18. Um, he was looking like a, he was going to be an important player for Liverpool, wasn't he, at the beginning of the season? But um, he hasn't played since September, um, so there's no there's no rush. You know they know that this is a long term project. They don't need them back. You know, it's not like uh, it would be of say Mohamed Salah was back in training after five months out, and you you kind of hope he was back as soon as possible. Liverpool's just going to continue biding the time with him. He's going to be back in training. He's probably going to get a good week or so in training um, over the next few days. I'd imagine. Um, not sure whether Liverpool are off this week actually, but certainly towards 
you know, starting next week, they'll be back in full training. Um, someone was suggesting to me that looking at maybe March is the time when you might see him back in the in a starting eleven or maybe even a, a match day squad. So there's there's no rush really, and I think that's entirely fair. This is a player who will be around for a long, long time. So um, there's no need to force him back in if it's a bit unnecessary and, and risk another injury. So um, yeah, it's, it's all good news, and we'll wait to see him back in a match day squad soon. Yeah, it'll be great when the, the time does come, Charlotte, to, to see him back. Is is he key, do you think, to, to helping Liverpool's midfield take that next step? We kind of saw that a little bit earlier on in the season. Uh yeah, yeah, I think so. We saw we saw a glimpse of it earlier this season. Um the the, the triangle with Trent and himself and Salah. So it gave you a clue as to what they've been working on in pre season and how they want to go forward. Um but yeah, I, I I think it it's a good thing that they're not rushing him back, that they're not in they're not in a position where they need to rush him back because he's so young and he's got such a long career ahead of him. So you want him to come back when he's ready and then have a long stint in the team and be part of that next the next phase in Liverpool's midfield where hopefully they'll sign someone in the summer who can come in and basically fit straight into that midfield and you want you you want to see where where Klopp's going to take it with with the midfield because it looked a bit leggy at times this season. It's with cert, with a certain trio in there, it looks quite aged and lacking creativity. So you're hoping someone like like Elliot can come in and really transform it. Yeah, certainly something to keep an eye on, hopefully over the next couple of weeks, if he is back in training with his Liverpool teammates, AFCON and South American qualifiers to keep you updated on as well, of course, across the Liverpool Echo website and on Blood Red as well. But that, though, is all we have time for on today's Blood Red podcast. My thanks to Paul Gorst, Ian Doyle and to Charlotte Coates for joining me. And until next time, it's goodbye for now.